it's not a before or after it's that it was it's really two different experiences different environments different challenges different idiosyncrasies Seen challenges there another unforeseen challenge was i didn't know how to drive and that's a crazy thing you i didn't know that i didn't know how to drive when hi my friends it's ro welcome back i am so over the moon excited to start a series about life after prison for a prison couple together with a couple can i say couple one more time <laughs> with a couple who has been there, who's done it, who's been married for close to 20 years, 10 years married while he was inside, plus almost 10 years now since he's been out. They are thriving, they're surviving, and they're answering all of your questions. So if you're interested in who they are, by the way, one of the most famous prison couples ever, in the background story and how we came together with this series, please keep watching. If you're new here, my name is Ro. I am the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Wives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code. We don't glorify or glamorize prison, prison wife life, or prison life here. But what I will do is teach you how to make the best out of this, frankly, really painful and hopefully only one shot deal. I am so excited to introduce you to my friends, Michael and Carol Santos. I know majority of you guys know who Michael is through his books. He's written tons of books while he was inside of prison and he also has written books while he was outside. He's been a friend of mine for a few years. I knew of Michael while he was still in prison. He had no idea who I was, no idea who Strong Prison Wives and Families was. I don't even know if it was a thing at that point. A friend of mine, it was actually the friend of mine who got me back in touch with Adam, introduced me to Michael's work because she wanted to learn about what it was like for inmates inside of prison. She wanted like a real raw account of what was going on in there. So she told me about Michael's books. I'm not one of those people that you could just tell me about somebody and I'm like, okay, whatever, and brush them off. I want to know about their background. I want to know what made him successful on the inside. I want to know who he is. Is he a good person? Is he somebody that I don't want to be associated with? Is he somebody maybe that I want to reach out to in the future? And through researching Michael and his work, I found his wife, Carol. I believe that she had a blog or she had some stuff that she was posting somewhere online at that point. And what I found, what I remember so specifically about finding this post or this article that she had written was she was talking about things that she wouldn't do again until her loved one was released, until Michael was released. And she said that, although I believe she was living in California at that point, because I know that they moved around a lot. Michael got moved from prison to prison a lot because of, exposing what was going on on the inside through his work. The bureaucracy didn't like that. So Carol had a job as a traveling nurse and she was able to move where he moved, which is amazing. So I believe at this point she was in California and she said, although I live right next to the ocean, I won't go back into the ocean. I won't step foot in the water until Michael can do that with me. And I remember through tears thinking, this is somebody that I can relate to and understand so much. I get it. I can get down with this post. I can be friends with this woman because she shows a loyalty that only a strong prison wife understands and knows. And I was like, what a, an amazing woman. That's all I remember from all the years ago. And then probably now seven or eight years ago, Michael had reached out to me and asked me to be a guest on his podcast. And we had this conversation on the phone and I was like, this guy is so cool. And I told Adam about it. And we had a similar circle of friends online. You guys know the trajectory of my story with my channel and the nonprofit. And then through my work online, Michael had found me and he reached out to me. This is probably going about seven or eight years ago. In the meantime, the next day after our initial call, I had jury duty. And this was so long ago, you guys, I had this teeny tiny little iPod that I could use at jury duty. On my way, I downloaded all of his podcast episodes that I could possibly fit on this teeny tiny little old school iPod. I just sat there all day long in jury duty because you know how they do it. They just leave you there all day until you're called into one of the courtrooms. And I just sat there and I learned Michael's story and I listened and I decided if this was somebody who I wanted to work with or not. And I thought he was great. And I thought that 
his lessons were great. I thought he was so articulate. I thought that he was one of the very few people who came home and hit the ground running and we need more of those stories versus all of the stories of people who kind of glamorize what's going on inside and are glorifying criminal life and don't really care if they're stuck in a revolving door and they leave us as chronic prison wives in and out. So I did the podcast, it came out awesome. I've been friends with Michael and Carol since. A couple of weeks ago, a woman who actually also does YouTube for prison wives, I'll link her channel below, it's Surviving the Prison Wife Life, she reached out to me and she said, Ro, I have a loved one who's been down for over 20 years. Do you know anybody who has been down for maybe 15 years or more who has been successful as a couple on the outside? Do you have any videos about that? And I said, no, but I know the perfect person. Right at that point, literally a week or two before, I had been working with Michael on a couple of projects together. So I reached out and I said, I can't think of a better couple to do this than you and Carol. And they were on it, they were amazing, and not only did they invest some time to do this, they literally are investing time to answer every single one of your questions that I sent to them one by one and work through them so we all have answers and we all have a toolkit to move forward when our loved ones come home so we could be as successful as Michael and Carol. And here's the thing, here's the best part of the whole entire thing. They said this was not easy. This wasn't a cakewalk. It wasn't what I think our loved ones, my loved one at least says all the time. Like this is the hard part. If we could survive this, we can survive anything in life. And while I do to some extent agree with what he's saying, we don't have the oppression of what's going on inside and we're not being controlled and we don't have the restrictions around our relationship. I also understand and appreciate what Michael and Carol are saying because they're not just going to be released into your arms and all problems are going to go away. I think it's going to be really hard for a few months, years, depending on how bad the PTSD is and how good your communication was while you were on the inside. So I don't want to make this intro too long. We're already going on 10 minutes. I have to chop a lot of that out. But I just want to tell you from my perspective how grateful I am for Michael and Carol in this series. I'm going to also link Michael's channel in the cards. I work with Michael. His channel is called Prison Professors. They literally go inside of prisons and they teach people how to be successful when they leave prison, which is amazing, or while they're inside. So then they can be successful if and when they are released. So make sure you follow Prison Professors. I don't know exactly how I'm going to post this series. I don't know if I'll drip the content over time. I don't know if I'll add an additional upload day to my upload schedule until we drip these out. But if you guys have any suggestions or preferences, let us know in the comments below. So without wasting any more time, here are Michael and Carol with their introduction, who they are, and their background stories. And then we'll answer a question or two. Please, please, please leave some love for Michael and Carol in the comments below because they've taken a lot of time out of their extremely busy schedules to create this series specifically to answer your questions, my questions, and help us help our loved ones get out, stay out, and be successful not only as contributing members to society, but also as loving husbands or wives when they get out. So without wasting any more time, here are Michael and Carol. We are super excited to make this contribution to Strong Prison Wives and Family. Ro Clausen is actually somebody who's doing a great service to, to families of, of people in prison. And that's something I know a lot about. I am so lucky because I have had a super strong prison wife. My name is Michael Santos. This is my wife. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Carol Santos. And we got married inside of a federal prison in 2003. Three? 2003, June 24th. We're filming this in mid-June 2020. So we are about to celebrate our 17th year of marriage. We spent 10 years of those marriage, of that marriage inside while I was still locked in federal prison. And my wife was just the epitome of a strong prison wife. I'm so proud of her and I'm happy to share our story with you. But in order to do this, we've decided that we'll try and film it on one camera We've got this microphone. I'm going to stretch it over to give it to Carol when it's time for you to speak. Just say hi, Carol. Hi. <laughs> and, and that way you can get good audio because we want to give you the best experience. We want to give you so much information with hopes that will help you your journey as you're going through the challenges of a, of a prison sentence, whether you're going through one month, whether you're going through 10 years, whether you're going for multiple decades, 
we have a story to share and we're just really grateful to uh, Roe Clausen for making this service available and we will answer any questions that you ask. That was just our intro. We're gonna go through the questions now and we hope you find some value in these messages. We actually met when we were quite young. We grew up in North Seattle and I moved to Lake Forest Park, which is on the north end of Lake Washington in the north end of Seattle. Carol had been living there. How long were you already living in Lake Forest Park? I think we were eight or nine. So we met when we were in the fifth grade. That's when I moved. We went to school together, went to classes together through elementary school, junior high school, and high school. But I would say that we weren't really good friends at that time. Maybe you have something to say about that? No, we definitely were not friends. We, we just moved in the same circles. We, we knew each other, but I moved in probably a little bit of a different circle that was getting into trouble and mischief, starting that in elementary school and in junior high school and in high school. And then our paths went in different directions. I went in the direction that eventually led me to a 45-year federal prison term, and Carol went in the direction of uh, getting married and having two children. And we didn't connect until I was in my what was that, my 15th year of imprisonment? I was in my 15th year of imprisonment. And it started because we, Carol was coordinating our 20-year high school reunion. We graduated from high school in 1982. And after we graduated, we lost contact. But Carol was putting together our 20-year high school reunion in 2002. And because of my published writing, somebody reached out, we're doing research on me or something, they reached out to the high school and they found that this information about the 20 year high school reunion and Carol was the coordinator and was putting it together. And that's how we met while I was in prison. Carol, any impact or anything I left out about that? No, it was, the internet was new and so it was, we were trying to figure out how to get everyone together and, and somebody reached out and asked about Michael and it was honestly the first time I thought about him since high school. And so that's what started a correspondence and then that correspondence turned into a friendship and that friendship turned into a love affair through daily letters and uh, we eventually got married on uh, June the 24th, 2003 and that was the luckiest day of my life. That's another great question, and all these questions are great because I know how, how challenging it is for, for, a, for a wife to have to um, deal with these expectations and the complications of living with somebody who's been in locked up for a long period of time. And of course, there aren't too many people that were locked up as long as I served. You know, I was in for 9,500 days or 9,135 days before that magical day when Carol picked me up inside of the prison in Atwater, California and drove me to a halfway house, which is when we began, well, partially began our life together. It still took some time before we could sleep together, but it was still a great experience. So was the relationship stronger during incarceration or after? For me, it's just been a series of extraordinary uh, events from the time that I got the first letter from Carol, which happened, I think, in February of 2002. Um, as I recall, it was not too long after Valentine's Day. And I got her letter and I was so inspired. I remember showing it to a friend of mine and saying, I'm going to make her my girlfriend. And because I was really, I, there was a time when I used to be very determined and, <laughs> and I was determined to make a life while I was in prison and being in prison really, what I really missed and wanted was a relationship with Carol, with, with a woman and that woman became Carol and it's something I dreamed of. So I would say it was extraordinarily strong there. I felt a sense of meaning and fulfillment, just being able to know what challenges she was facing and then to figure out what could I do to help make her life better. And that's really what I have been doing ever since then is just trying to make her life better, trying to make her proud, trying to be a good husband, even though I was locked in, incarcerate, in prison for the first 10 years of our marriage. When I came home, I would say it was definitely better because I got to live with her and I was afraid kind of of her um, seeing some of the idioc idiosyncrasies that I had developed over multiple decades in prison, um, such as my work ethic, where I start work really early in the morning and 
uh, and work and uh, really intensely. And, and you can speak to that if that's hard for you to live with. But that, but, but that's who I am. And it was one thing me telling her that's who I was when I was in prison. But I think it might have been something different for you to experience it. <laughs> so we're working through it. I would say that we're still working through it. But what holds it all together is I'm deeply committed to her. I'm incredibly 100% faithful and loyal to her. And, and I'm just really grateful for everything that she did for me um, to come and visit me and, and, and help me build my career while I was incarcerated and put up with all of the, uh, you know, massive uh, intensity of my life. And there's a lot of intensity and I know it can sometimes be challenging. But I would say it was strong in prison, stronger since I've been home. That's my perspective. <laughs> How about you, honey? And there's, no, and there's no right or wrong answer. You can be honest. Yeah, I know. Okay. For me, it's not a before or after. It's that it was, it's really two different experiences, um, different environments, different challenges, different... Um, idiosyncrasies. There were definitely challenges when he was inside for me, you know, with moving frequently, driving to visit, really arranging my entire life around what was going on in the prison system. And there were times when things happened that nobody had any control over because of the bureaucracy and just figuring out how to you know, navigate that, especially I didn't know anything about prison when I started writing to Michael. Um, so those kinds of challenges um, made us strong because we, we did it together and I learned a lot and I made it a point to understand his environment. So I was always asking questions and I learned the policies and those were always my greatest strengths when I was advocating on the outside was that I, I probably knew the policies better than the bureaucrats that I was having to deal with a lot of times. And and then coming home, it was great. We had, you know, the transition was easy. Um, I would say different challenges, um, prison behaviors or idiosyncrasies as you said uh walk, can, walk them through like what does that mean what does that um, mean like i see the next question this kind of falls into the next question what were some of the unforeseen challenges that you had after michael came home and i when when i read that i think about the plastic issue <laughs> so you might explain that <laughs> that was unforeseen yes he was uncomfortable with normal silverware and dishware so everything is plastic um in everything fact, had been plastic for me for 26 years it's like... we still have plastic glasses <laughs> these are the same plastic glasses that i had to go and purchase um so it's things like that and just i think you know for me i'd lived alone really for 10 years so it was it was and i had you know my activities um that I did. And so it was just, it was different having him in the house with me. And then he was on supervised release and there was probation. So we weren't free of the prison system for several years. So there was always sort of that tension of, you know, knowing, you know, they could try to make things hard for him and for us. So that, that was, I didn't expect that. I thought that when he came home that we could just exhale and that would kind of be, you know, it would be over and then we would have our life uh, and that didn't happen. So that, that was, I was not prepared for that. Um, and I think there were times, there are times when I get very frustrated with that and it, like just tired of the BOP and tired of the bureaucracy and, you know, can't you just leave us alone? Um, he's much better at letting that roll off his shoulders than I am. So, you know, that can be a challenge as well. It's just a lot of, you know, just, and just kind of getting to know each other after being married for 10 years. That's it. We did it backwards. <laughs> yeah. No premarital sex. Okay. 
<laughs> but I'll tell you what was what was unforeseen challenge. So another unforeseen challenge was I didn't know how to drive. And that's a crazy thing. You, I didn't know that I didn't know how to drive. When you know how to drive, you think you'd never forget. I don't know when I forgot how to drive, but it took me a long time to learn. It takes a long time the second time to learn how to drive. And I had this conversation privately with Ro, telling because I know that when Adam comes home, that's a, a potential, you know, conversation because you we think I thought I could get behind the wheel of a car. But the reality is when you've been in prison for 26 years, your body never moves faster than your legs can carry you. So our eyes are not adjusted to cars and oncoming traffic. And it took me, what was it like three months before I felt comfortable as a driver? Uh, maybe you're, she's still not comfortable. <laughs> Go ahead, honey, tell her. Be honest. It's okay. Ah, makes me laugh. <laughs> I had to teach him how to drive on the streets of San Francisco, on the bridges of San Francisco, the, that hills, are, of San Francisco. the hills of San Francisco, the many freeways and interchanges that are challenging for anybody who's an experienced driver. And there were times when I would just say, just pull over and I'm driving. And I would say it was just the opposite, honey. You were amazingly supportive. I would ask the stupidest questions like, well, how do you know what's going to happen after that curve? <laughs> Because I, I couldn't figure that out. I said, well, what if somebody's pulled over? And you'd say, well, I don't know, honey. I just, she was just really always supportive. And I would never say that you were hard to me and say, just pull over. I was probably the one that was a little bit scared and said, I will pull over. I always felt that Carol was an amazing, amazingly strong and supportive wife who supported me through every challenge. And But the irony is that after 26 years, the two biggest challenges I had we're learning how to drive and learning how to drink out of a glass and eat with silverware. And I'll end that with this and we'll go to the next question. <laughs> Unless you have something else. But that's all I remember. And uh, we'll come back. Don't you guys love them as much as me? I know you do. If you do, give me a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below. I'll link all these videos together in a playlist. This was just the introduction one. I love you guys and I'll see you in the next one.